We're in a sermon series uh, called Building uh, Our Family of Faith and looking at the church, the letter to the church in, uh, that Paul wrote to them in First Thessalonians. Uh, I don't know what your week has been like. It seems like every time I get up here, every couple of weeks, we have uh, it just a little bit more uh, added to our plates, a little more dysfunction in the world, a little more uh, chaos and uncertainty. Uh, certainly the backdrop behind that being a global pandemic in which uh, people, some 200,000 folks in our country have lost their lives since uh, they began counting. Uh, and it just weighs on you. Uh, there are certain weeks and days that it doesn't feel like it's overburdensome, and then other days and weeks it feels like uh, you're just looking for uh, a long walk by yourself uh, to just think through those things. This week has been one of those for me, uh, just uh, personally. Not that there's been any one thing that has been overwhelming or, or taxing or stressful, but I think it's just the culmination. I think it's the day and age that we find ourselves in, uh, that we find uh, there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of things that uh, cause us to doubt, uh, have a little bit of uncertainty, maybe in our families, maybe in our own personal life. I know that uh, sometimes uh, with the arrival of a diagnosis, uh, an unexpected accident, something like that can completely change your outlook uh, for your future. Um, also, uh, I'm a father, uh, happily married, and a father of two beautiful girls. Uh, one of them is in middle school this year. The other one is not far along. And so I'm in that season of life as a dad, uh, me and my wife are. And one of the things that we talk about a lot at our home, uh, I know many of you parents can relate with this, is when is the appropriate time that your child gets access to to the thing that we talk about, like phones and internet and all that sort of thing. And, and as a father, uh, an adult father, knowing what is out there in the world of the internet and the access that not just what my children would have access to, but who's on the other end of that would have access to them, it's really stressful trying to help your child grow up in the age of technology and the internet and those sorts of things. And so also this week, I've had a lot of uh, meetings this week in particular with other pastors in our city uh, and then in our state, uh, just talking about random things and just uh, the, the feeling, and I heard this from a guy uh, this week, just that the pressure of pastoring in a pandemic, the pressure of, you know, being a pastor, there's normal level of chaos, uh, especially in a Baptist church, that you just roll with. And so uh, personality-wise, I'm, I'm okay with that. But then uh, talking with other guys around the state about the, the pressure of, uh, you know, uh, decrease in attendance, the ongoing pandemic, um, just the... Uh, the inner, the, the, that folks are not as connected maybe in their church as they were before the pandemic. And, and a lot of people who were perfectly fine not ever really coming back to church, that this has been a good break for them and they're just going to kind of go into that area of their life. And so as a pastor, you hurt when you see folks that are just content with not really being involved with church and by extension of that, not really being involved with what the church is about, about fellowship about growing in their relationship with the Lord and, and all of those things. And so uh, I had a friend of mine ask me, he said, uh, how many of the guys that you talk to once this is over you think are going to quit? And I stopped for a second. I was like, I don't, none of them. Is that even a thing right now? And the reality, though, out there is there's a lot of, a lot of guys, a lot of people, even in their own work. Now, let's just take it outside of a church, for instance, that the pressure of living in this day and age is to the point where we all feel like it's time to hit the eject button, that we're going to get to a point where we may say, okay, I've gone as far as I can go, and now I'm going to let somebody else do this, or I'm going to let someone else take over. And so I didn't know how encouraged, how encouraged I would be by reading this short little letter to the Thessalonians, how it shows us uh, of God's... Uh, love of God's power, of the ability to have joy in the midst of suffering and struggle and how what they are going on, going through as an early church 2,000 years ago is the same story that you and I are going through right now in our lives and how those things connect up and how God is always speaking exactly what we need to hear in that moment. And I know I'm not the only one and, and by no means am I thinking about quitting or, you know, relocating somewhere and not telling anybody where I went or anything like that. But the reality is, it's just a stressful time. We find ourselves in stressful times, but we know that people have been through far more stressful times than we have now, and so we endure. But we don't want to just go through it through the motions. We don't want to just endure just to arrive at a finish line. Maybe we could endure in a way 
that would show those watching around us that what we believe about God, what we believe about His Word, is really true. That what we are doing here this morning, that we have gathered from all sorts of parts of Jacksonville, North Carolina. We've gathered from different backgrounds and different families, different uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, that we believe in Jesus Christ, that not only he is, uh, that not only did He come and live a great and perfect life, but that He died in a specific way for our sins and that God raised Him to life three days later. That in faith in Him truly changes everything about us, that it has the power to take us from who we are before Christ to who we are now, but not leave us there and see us all the way through to the end. And we're living in a day and age in which there are a million ideas out there to solve what's wrong with us. Some of them are organized. Some of them are better organized than others. But there's so many things right now competing for our attention, competing for our faith, competing for our allegiance. And we cannot forget, church, that the thing that God has given us to change our lives is His very Word. I tried to summarize this up this week, and I'll tell you, this this sermon prep this week has been a hot mess, but let's say it like this. There's nothing that the world, this world can do to us that the Word of God cannot undo for us. There's nothing that this world can do to us that God's Word cannot undo for us. And that's a hope that I hope... We can hold on to here. And so what we're going to, we don't have any, I don't have any, I say we, like we all wrote this together. I don't have any special points together this morning. We're just going to read four verses, 13 through 16, and make some comments. And hopefully God will do what he desires to do. But think about this again, just as a, before we get into the text, where this church is. And so Paul with Silas and Timothy are going through an area preaching the gospel and they come to this city where there is no gospel presence yet, and they do what they always do. They set up shop in the synagogue, and they preach two ideas. The first idea is that the Messiah, the one that the Jews were all looking for, had to suffer, had to die, and had to be resurrected. They looked in the Old Testament and taught them, this is what you ought to be looking for. And after they made that case, they made a case accompanying it, this Jesus, this Jesus we're telling you about, is this guy. This Jesus is the Messiah. Now, some people in the Jewish synagogue believed. They staked their life on it, but others, they chose not to believe. And that same gospel that they preached to the Jews, they would preach to the Gentiles that God sent His Son into this world and lived a perfect life, died on a cross for them and for their sins, was murdered, put in a tomb for three days, and resurrected three days later, in order that through faith in Him we might have life. And even Gentiles would come to faith. But some of the Gentiles would get angry because their way of life, their whole way of living would be turned up, ended by this good news. And then they would seek to run those people out of town. And so everywhere Paul and his uh, team of folks would go, they would preach the gospel, people would get saved, and quickly enemies would arise to try to snuff out the spread of the gospel. And so that's what's going on here. Now keep in mind, this this is before phones, this is before internet, email, any of those things. And so they're in this city for three weeks. For three weeks, they're in the city preaching and teaching the gospel, baptizing people, and people are coming to faith. And at the end of those three weeks, enemies arise and run Paul and Silas and Timothy out of the city. And so they are no longer with this young church. And after a little bit of time goes by, Paul writes a letter to encourage them. And so 1 Thessalonians is a letter written back to these early Christians. This church that had its leaders for three weeks to strengthen them and to encourage them. And so I looked at that this week and I was like, well shoot. If they can make it, so can we. We got more things going for us than they really had for them. We've been around longer than three weeks, okay? I will acknowledge that their leaders are better than your leader, but still, we have our leader around here. But at the end of the day, if they can make it, then why can't we? If these early believers who are suffering for their faith, who don't have a lot of resources, who are not organized very well, or any of those things that we look at, don't have a strong voting block, don't have uh, power and those sorts of things, if they can make it, 
then why can't we? Because the, the important thing to realize is why they made it to begin with. And so Paul begins to close out the early section of his letter with remembering something about this early church that I think can encourage us here today. And it's in ver- found in verse 13. He says, we also, and so remember, this is Paul, Silas, and Timothy. We also thank God constantly. That is to thank God without ceasing. This is the same word that he uses when he talks about praying without ceasing. He says, we thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And so let's, let's talk about some of these words that start showing up. It says that they received the word of God. This word received talks about what we do when we receive tra- tradition that's passed on to us. And so there's a tradition of the gospel, basically what the gospel is, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so he said that when they brought this tradition of the gospel that wasn't very old, but the traditional story of the gospel, the uh, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and all of the benefits that come from that, when, he, when they brought that to them, they received it. They, they received it like it was something that was important. Tradition has a way of doing that to us. A few weeks ago, we were talking about how to streamline one of our parts of our service. If you've grown up in a Baptist church, you realize that at the end of the songs before the offering is taken up, normally ushers will come down uh, front and they'll stand at the front and then someone will stand up and they'll say a prayer. Well, we realized uh, of no fault of the ushers and really no fault of our own that sometimes the ushers may come a little early or they may come a little late. And so it was just hard to try to line that up. And so we just thought of that we would simplify the process and the ushers wouldn't come down until after the amen of the offertory prayer. There'd still be enough time to do what we need to do. And that would help the ushers not have an awkward moment where they're coming down front and they're singing for two minutes because they jumped the gun a little bit. And so I reached out to a couple of our ushers and I said, hey, can you, do you know why we come down at the end of the song anyways? And they were like, you know, tell you the truth, I have no idea. That's what they were doing when I showed up. And so then I'd ask a few people that maybe were there earlier, and they were like, you know what, I have no idea why they do that. That's just what they were doing when I showed up. And I was like, well, that's how tradition is sometimes. None of us really know why we do that, but we do that nonetheless. And so Paul says that he brought the tradition of the gospel to them, and they received it. Some people don't receive the tradition because they don't believe that there's any merit. But Paul says to the church in Corinth, he says, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The tradition of the gospel, the the good news of the gospel, for some of us, it completely changed our lives. But maybe someone sitting right next to us in the same story the same service who heard the same story, they were just kind of like, eh, I don't know what I'm going to do with that. Or, you know, I'm too busy to do that. Or maybe I'll do that at a later date. Because they didn't receive it as a tradition to hold on to. They received it as something less. Paul says that they, when they received the Word of God, they also they heard it from them. And so you may think, okay, well, it's, hard. it's not hard to understand that when you hear something, you receive it. But the, the biblical word there of hearing takes it a step further. It's always hearing that is responded with obedience. It's always hearing with a response of obedience. So if you don't obey to what you've heard, you didn't really hear it. And if you grew up in a family in the South, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You ever had your mom or your dad uh, or your grandma or your granddad look at you and say, did you not hear what I said? All right, you know what I'm talking about. My grandma said, Ryan, did you not hear what I said? That immediately in my mind, I was thinking, she told me to do something or not do something, and I have not fixed that in my life yet. And so immediately, you want to obey what is said in that moment. That's what Paul says. You heard it from us because you began obeying it. And we know that the New Testament has a lot of uh, instruction on the lifestyle th- choices that we should avoid and the things that we ought to do. And so this is what Paul's talking about when they they hear the Word of God. And then it says that they accepted it. That word accept there means to welcome it. To welcome it. Not to say, okay, yeah, that's for me. I'll, I'll take it. But to welcome it, to be excited about it. If you've ever been at a restaurant in Jacksonville on the 15th or the 30th, and you've ordered some food, 
and you're like, man, it takes forever. And then they call your name. You don't just say, oh, I've been sitting here for an hour. Yeah, sure, I'll take that food. When they call your last name, you're like, yes, Hearn, party of whatever, bring me that food. You're, you're excited that that food is there. You're welcoming that food to your table. And that's what Paul says. They received it as a tradition. They heard it and obeyed and they accepted it. They welcomed it. Not as a word of men, but as it is the word of God. The word of God, which is at work in you believers. And so that's, that's another sermon for another day. But you have to realize, church, that we are living in a day and age in which the word of God, as it always has been, is at odds with the word of men. There are words and ideas of men right now that are popular in the world, and some have even crept up into the church that if we're not careful, we will forsake the word of God for ideas that man puts forth. And there's so many out there right now, and some of them are, are kind of tricky. They're kind of hard to, to nail down, but, but Paul is just simply saying to this early church that they received the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ, as if it was straight from God's mouth, which it was. And it also points us to something that the Word of God is at work in them. The Word of God is at work in them. This idea of work is not something that we do to the Word of God, but it is the Word of God that does to us. Maybe in your life you struggled before Christ, you struggled with an addiction, or you struggled with you're, maybe you're greedy about money or lustful about the opposite sex. Maybe you gave your life to pleasure and seeking pleasure or power or something like that. And then you remember the first time that you heard the gospel preached and you believe that Christ did live his life and die his death so that you might have life and forgiveness of sins. In that moment, your life was forever changed. And then after that, the word of God began changing you in your heart. It changed the way you looked at other people. Maybe you had a racist attitude before you met Christ, and once you met Christ, you stopped being a racist. Maybe not completely, but the Word of God works in your heart that way. And then you, you're putting off the old way of life, and you're putting on the new way of life. That's a, just another way of saying that the Word of God is at work in you, and it's working in you passively, meaning that as you read it, as you think about it, as you meditate on it, as you learn about it in Sunday school class, as I preach about it here on Sunday and we sing about it in our songs and we pray about it in our prayers, that the Word of God is changing us a little bit at a time, as Paul might say, from one degree to another. We're not stuck in the same place that we are. If you're stuck in your life in the same place you were when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Word of God is not working in your life. It has an effect. Now, it's not an instant like that. It's not like your whole in life gets uh, put in order, but it is working. It is, it is changing us, our values, our, our, our ambitions, our actions, the way we raise our children, the way we talk to each other, the way that we choose forgiveness instead of bitterness, and we choose to be peaceful instead of angry. It does all of those things in us. It's such a powerful agent in this word, in this world, the word of God is. But this is a choice that we must all decide. When the Word of God is preached, the Gospel is preached to us, and then the Gospel is preached to us in, in, in bite-sized pieces that deal with other areas of our life, we all make the decision whether or not we're going to receive this or we're going to refuse it. Whether or not we're going to hear it or we're going to ignore it. Whether or not we're going to accept it or we're going to dismiss it. That's the Word of God. Every person must make that decision for themselves. God does not have grandchildren. He only has children. We all make that decision and respond or choose not to respond to the Word of God when we hear it. That's why it's so important for those who have heard the Word of God to take the Word of God to other people. You may not know this, but within three miles of this church, now we're not the only church in this three-mile bubble, but within three miles of this church, there are 26,000 or so people that self-identify as lost. How will they know if we do not take the Word of God to them? Now, not all of them are going to respond affirmatively to the Word of God, but some are. And how beneficial it is that someone decided to bring the Word of God to us, and how terrible would it be if we chose not to take the Word of God to others? How sad would it be? I mean, we, would we really miss the letter to the Thessalonians from Paul? 
He took the word of God in so many places. Surely he'd be okay if he didn't take the word of God to these Thessalonians. It is like that, the word of God. We must take it to people who need to hear it. And so how we ask our questions, how do we know that the work of God, the word of God is, is working in our own lives? Surely our marriages will possibly improve. Surely our, our, our love for our neighbor and our, our maybe the way that we parent our children will improve if the word of God is having an effect on us. I've already mentioned um, it, we will not show favoritism to one group or the other. We will not be racist towards one group or the other. We will not be angry towards one group or the other or dismissive or hateful. That would be an evidence that the word of God is working in our heart. But Paul ties the, the knowledge that the word of God is working in these Thessalonians to a specific action going on in their life. And so while it may be true that you can see if the Word of God is working in the many different areas of your life, the one we need to focus on this morning is the one that Paul said to them. Look what he says in verse 14. For you, brothers, again, there's that term, brothers and sisters. This is a family discussion. Beca became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. So, Paul knows that the Word of God is happening in their life because they became imitators of all these other churches that went on before them. There's nothing going on in the, at the Brookwood Baptist Church that hasn't been going on in churches since they first started having churches. Our story is not that different than their story. And there's some similarities that are, if they're present in a church, that means they are a church that it can fit in within the historical narrative. Off, because you know it's COVID season, and so, um, but most of y'all are 15 feet away from me, so you're good to go. Um, so these churches in Judea, when you look back in Acts, the, the, the disciples are gathered together in the upper room, the Holy Spirit falls, and the gospel begins to be preached with signs and wonders and people start coming to faith and putting their faith in Jesus Christ and being baptized and then they're gathered together and they start devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings, to breaking bread, uh, to praying together, all the things that churches do. And so these churches start popping up all over Jerusalem and then in a few short chapters, persecution comes in the form of Saul and Saul ravages the church, and the church begins to spread all over the area around Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. And so the, the churches are spreading because they're scared that they're going to die, that they're going to be killed for their faith, but they don't go in hiding. Luke records for us in the Gospel of Acts that when they went to a new town, what did they do? They went to the first synagogue they could find and began preaching the Gospel. And then some of those believers didn't just preach the gospel to, Gen to the Jews, they went and preached them to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles. <clears throat> and churches began to be formed, and they began to get persecuted. And so Paul says to them and to us, you know that the word of God is working in your heart when you are imitating the churches that have gone on before you, namely being able to endure the suffering that comes along with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is where my heart is heaviest this week. That I'm not sure that I'm ready, my family's ready, or my church family is ready for the days that we are about to get into. Church, it is going to be increasingly more difficult to be a believer in this world than it has been any time in your life. It is going to be really difficult to say that you love Jesus and to preach the Word of God and to love your neighbor and not be attacked to not be your character slam, to not possibly lose your job, to lose friends, just like it is all over the rest of the world, but we're in an American bubble of freedom and we don't understand that this sort of thing's been going on for so long and yet we are, our country is ripe for the time in which Christians will be persecuted for their faith. If you don't believe me, then listen for the next two or three weeks at this confirmation hearing and listen to whether or not they pick pick her apart because of her faith. They'll pick her apart because of her faith. I love that what she said, that she was not under any illusion. This is Amy Barrett yesterday. No, no illusion 
of what she was about to enter into, not in the short term or the long haul, but she promises to proceed with humility and courage. Humility and courage. Courage and faith in Jesus Christ. That's what we're all called to. And Paul says that I know the Word of God is at work in you because you are imitating the churches that have gone before. And he might say to us today, I know that God's Word is at work amongst the believers at Brookwood Baptist Church because they are choosing to endure under suffering. They are choosing to imitate the churches that have gone on before them. Look at what Paul says. They, he says, uh, and for you suffered the same thing from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. Meaning that nothing that's going on in your life right now is any different than what went on in the early church. And there's nothing going on different in our country right now than what has always gone on in the church life. The church is attacked by the enemies of the gospel. Paul says, uh, he refers to them as Jews with a capital J. And he says that you received from your own countrymen the same thing. And so countrymen and Jews, we're talking about the Jewish enemies of the gospel and the Gentile enemies of the gospel. And the point is, the gospel has always had enemies. Everywhere the gospel goes, enemies attack. Sometimes they come from people that you don't know, and sometimes they come from those who are closest to you. There's nothing new about what we are experiencing. Look at what Paul said. The Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, <clears throat> and they drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they may be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. Paul levies a very damning accusation here. The Jews, they've been responsible for killing Jesus. They've been responsible for killing the prophets. They're responsible for running us off. They're responsible for trying to keep the gospel from going to the Gentiles. But that doesn't make sense. Because Paul used to be called Saul, and he ran around with his rabble. In fact, he was the first guy that showed up on scriptures in the, in the book of Acts trying to kill Christians. So Paul can't be specifically talking about Jews, all Jews. He's talking about a certain kind of Jew. The Jew that is against the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just like there's a, not all Americans are against the gospel, but some Americans are against the gospel. You see that? That there has always been an enemy to the gospel of Jesus Christ that, has, that chooses and desires and strategizes and uses all of their power and manipulation to try to snuff, off, snuff out the good news of Jesus Christ. And Paul says to them that, that you are enduring the same type of nonsense that we have always endured. These people, the enemies of the gospel, will always try to snuff out the spread of the gospel. And so the Word of God, though, gives us encouragement. It gives us the, the confidence to pursue. How many of us would really be willing to go to our death if we didn't believe that this was the Word of God? How many of us would be willing to lose our business, to lose our relationship and our family if we didn't believe this was the Word of God? The disciples said to Jesus, uh, we've given up everything, like money, lifestyles, everything. We've given up our family. And Jesus says, you ain't given up anything that you will not receive in this life. Meaning that if you give up your job and it costs you your job to follow Jesus, don't worry about that. If you lose your family because you decided to follow Jesus, don't worry about that. If you lose your stature in this country because you preach the name of Jesus Christ, don't worry about that because you're going to get a new family in the church. You're going to walk on streets of gold one day. You're going to have power and influence as a follower and a child of God one day. And so no matter what we give up in this life, it cannot compare to what we get when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. This suffering that we experience is temporary. But the blessings of being a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ lasts forever. 
There is nothing that this world can do to us that the word of that that the word of God cannot undo for us. And Paul's a great example of this, just like the Thessalonians are. Just all of us. Paul didn't do anything and being an enemy to the gospel that you and I weren't doing before we had faith in Christ. If Paul, who killed Christians, can be welcomed into the kingdom of God and given the job of spreading this gospel for the salvation of others and for the glory of God, if he can be given a job like that, so can I. How many of us in here lived for uh, ourselves before the Lord saved us? How many of us in here were rebellious towards His law, were wicked and evil and sinned in small ways and in large ways, and God was still merciful and loved us and forgave us and put us in His kingdom, adopted us as sons and daughters, and gave us the responsibility of preaching this same good news to a watching world. He can do that for anyone. It's not that... These, this group of enemies are too far to be saved. It's that the enemies of God, they don't ever want to be saved. There are always going to be enemies out there. I got news for you. I'm not sure which one's going to be worse over the long term come November. There's just no hope in elections. There, there's no hope in power. There's no hope in any of those things. We as Christians are living in a day and age which is going to be more suffering for following Jesus. And and Jesus taught this very same thing. He said a sower went into a field one day and he was sowing seeds and some of the seed fell on the ground. And some of the seeds fell on the rocky ground and some of the seeds fell in the where the thorns and the thistles grew, but some of the seed fell in that fertile ground. Now the seeds that fell on the the rock on the uh, on the on the pathway, it was gobbled up quickly. And some of that seed fell in a rocky ground and it started to grow. But after it got hot, after there was some suffering, after there was some difficulty, they no longer wanted to have anything to do with it. And then some of that seed, it fell in the lives of people who get distracted really easy. Or maybe get distracted by having church attendance off because of a pandemic or something like that. And they grow to think, you know what, it's not so bad not going to church. I can do without this. And for whatever reason, they turn away from the Lord. But some of the Word of God falls on a fertile ground and it produces 15, 160 fold. The point is, it's miraculous. And that's the hope that we have. That's the hope that I have as as an individual. That's the hope that I have for my children. That's the hope that I have for my church family. And it is certainly the hope that I have for this world and the city and the 26,000 people within three miles of this that are lost. The only hope that they have is not in my personality. It's not in our creativity. It's not in our any of the things that we would fill in that blank. The only hope they have to make it with what's coming is in the Word of God that the Word of God would produce in them what it has always produced in the people who believe. Life and change. There's nothing that this world can do to us that the Word of God cannot undo for us. This part ends with the phrase, but wrath has come upon them at last. And it it reads like it's an encouragement. Why is it encouraging that the wrath of God has come on them at last, the enemies of God? Could it be to encourage those who are suffering that God sees exactly what's going on? Paul says in Romans that the wrath of God has been poured out on mankind in that He gives us over to our desires. He lets us go from bad to worse. But there's also a wrath of God that comes in the end. And the language here offers both interpretations that God's wrath is being poured out and yet God's wrath has not yet been poured out to the full. But the point is, God's wrath on His enemies is so certain that it should give us hope. You may not live long enough to see God's wrath poured out on those who 
persecute you. But you will see it one day in which God will right every wrong. He will correct every error. He will silence every liar. He will beat back every enemy that has ever existed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And He will judge righteously all of those who have rejected His free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, His Son. That should give us encouragement that we don't have to do it. I guess my biggest fear is not that you're going to lose your faith, but that you're not going to be pushed around very well. There's something in us that when we are pushed, we like to push back. But that's not the way of Christ, is it? The way of Christ is to say, you know what? God's going to take care of this one day. So I'm just free to love. I'm just free to serve. I'm free to pray. And if you and I can get to that point to where those who are persecuting us and falsely accusing us and taking away our properties and taking away our church building and taking away everything that we have enjoyed and continue to serve them and love them and preach this gospel to them in hopes that they may be saved, if we get there, then we can say, as Paul said to the Thessalonians, we know that the work of God is at work, the word of God is at work in us. There'll be no, there'll be no confusion how a little old church in Jacksonville, North Carolina was able to endure all of that suffering and maintain their faith and witness for Christ. It wasn't because they were strong. It wasn't because they had a lot of money or a lot of influence. It was because the Word of God was at work in them so greatly and mightily that it produced in them righteousness. Church, this is what God has called us to. It's what He has always called His churches to. How will we respond? Will you pray with me? God, my prayer this morning, early this morning, God, is the same for right now, Lord, that Your that your Word would be at work in our hearts, accomplishing everything that it desires to do. God, that we might receive it, that we may hear it and accept it like our brothers and sisters at the church in Thessalonians, that it would make such an impact in our hearts that we might be able to imitate all the churches who have gone on before us, even churches that exist in the world today, that we might suffer well, that we might count it a joy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ, that we might endure, that we would not be distracted by a false offer of social justice or distracted by a false offer of political power and influence, that we might not be distracted by the promises of an easier lifestyle, but Lord, that we would lean in to what You've called us to. You've called us to suffering. Paul says that if we share in His sufferings, that we will share in His glories. And so God, I pray, not because there's something wrong with us, but because there's something right with us because of the Word of God, that we might embrace the life that You've called us to as believers. Lord, let us make a deposit now in our hearts and our minds before it gets here that when the suffering comes, so will the work of God. That we believe in all of our heart that there's nothing that this world can do to us that the Word of God cannot undo for us. And God, I pray for those in our midst that don't know You that this sounds a little this sounds a little crazy. God, I pray that you might let them see that this is the true power of God for the salvation of everyone who calls on the name of Jesus Christ. That you might move them to call out in faith to the only one who can do anything about their situation. Just like we all did at one point in our life. Father, we thank you for these things. We pray that we would continue to walk by faith and not by sight. Because sight is a little overwhelming right now. But we're just doing what you've always called your people to do. To live out the rest of our lives for the glory of God and for the good of our neighbors. We pray all this in Christ's name. 
Amen.